We're very excited about our forecast event. We're thankful that we have such great attendance, and I think it's going to be a great morning. So um, we want to get this show started. I'd like to thank Stan Longhofer and the Center for Real Estate for doing all of their research throughout the year on our regional market. And I would also like to thank Meritrust and Security First for helping to underwrite the forecast publications that are at your tables. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our 2018 RSCK president, Todd Woodburn. I am thrilled to see such a great turnout this morning. I thank each of you for being here. We have an information-packed morning for you, so keep up. We're ready to roll. I'd like to introduce Dr. Lawrence Yoon. Lawrence is Chief Economist and Senior Vice President of Research for the National Association of Realtors. He oversees and is responsible for sales statistics, affordability index, and home buyers and sellers profile report. He regularly provides commentary on real estate market trends for its one million realtor members. Dr. Yoon creates NAR forecasts and participates in many economic forecasting panels, among them the Blue Chip Council and the Harvard University Industrial Economic, excuse me, Economist Council. He appears regularly on financial news outlets, is a frequent speaker at real estate conferences throughout the United States, and has testified before Congress. Dr. Yoon appears often as a guest of CS, C-SPAN's uh, Washington Journal, and is a regular guest columnist on the Forbes website. Dr. Lawrence Yoon is also our Region 9 liaison uh, to the NAR Executive Committee. We've had him in Kansas a couple times before, and it's his first time to Wichita. So let's give Dr. Lawrence Yoon a big RSCK welcome. Uh, well, uh, very great to be here. Uh, what a warm hospitality here in middle America, Kansas. Um, so uh, the housing market or real estate market, uh, I would say over the past few years has been chugging along nicely, uh, you know, moving up steadily, uh, except only in recent months. Uh, NAR data came out last week showing that home sales have come down to three-year low levels. Mortgage rates have hit 10-year high levels. And also with the Federal Reserve raising interest rates, that will probably pressure in the commercial real estate, the jargon cap rates, the cap rates to begin to inch higher, uh, which means that either the rents have to be extracted at much uh, aggressive pace, or if that cannot be done because of the market condition, maybe there need to be some downward uh, price adjustment in commercial real estate. So there is a little bit of transition period uh, that is going on. Uh, furthermore, uh, some of you who are invested in the stock market, well, last couple of days or even the whole month has been little ups and downs going on. And even today, I think uh, it is showing uh, a downward, uh, one can say, adjustment. Uh, I'm not sure if we are in the correction territory, but uh, the stock market is also showing some little wobble uh, in the uh, market. So what can we anticipate uh, given these factors at play? And what are some foundations? And are those foundations very solid so that it is fairly easy to know with more certainty about what, what can happen? So what I want to do today uh, is to uh, first uh, give you the economic backdrop, you know, which impacts both residential as well as on the commercial, and then go into the housing market, cover commercial real estate, and give my best estimation on the forecast outlook for the next couple of years. 
Uh, first, you know, I want to thank uh, President uh, Todd for uh, inviting me to come to uh, South Central uh, Kansas. And I'm glad to see uh, in the audience uh, uh, President Kathy Minden, who is the state uh, realtors uh, president from Kansas, are driving long distance. She said she left her driveway at 5 a.m., came here, but the good news is that she got a closing done what, during the drive. <laughs> uh, so, um, so let's see. Uh, it's a good economy, without a doubt. One can look at so many statistics on the economy uh, showing that job addition for eight straight years Unemployment rate at under 4%. The latest is 3.7%. When I took Econ 101 class for the very first time, um, in a free society, unemployment rate will not be zero because people have freedom. Freedom to quit their job, search for better ones. Companies, employers have freedom to fire incompetent workers. So in a free society, we will never have 0% unemployment, but what is considered normal in a free society? And the figure that was tossed out was maybe five or 6%. Today, we are at 3.7% unemployment rate, even below what would be considered a normal. Stock market, yes, it is wobbly, but if you compare it to one year ago, I think it is still up. If you compare it to two or three years ago, you say, yeah, it is comfortably higher. And if you compare it to five or six or seven years ago, you say, oh, I am rich. Uh, so because a uh, stock market is you know, going up, up, and up. Uh, so even with little wobbles, maybe stock market just got ahead of itself just too much. Price earnings ratio was just out of lines and maybe it's just trying to go back to a more normal price earnings ratio. Because of the high stock market, Again, you know, it's a little wobble, but it's still up compared to one year ago. And also home values rising. Home values are the source of wealth for middle class Americans. So with home values rising, you combine housing wealth with a stock market wealth, and in America, the net worth for the country. Everything you own minus everything you owe, what is your net, and add up that figure individually across all of uh, every Americans, we are easily at an all-time high. For people without an exposure to housing wealth, without exposure to stock market wealth, finally their wages are beginning to pick up because increase in wages is the first step towards economic progress. You have to earn a little more and hopefully people can save some of that away and use that as maybe future down payment. You consider the wealthiest American today. It is not Bill Gates, it is not Warren Buffett. Yeah, they are very wealthy, but it's Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, teenage years, he worked at McDonald's trying to earn some wages. So there's nothing wrong with starting out trying to earn wages. My son in high school, he worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken because we wanted him out of the basement. He has to just go out and do some, <laughs> experience the real world. Uh, so. Uh, you know, it's, but people uh, who are not maybe in the best of circumstance, at least now their wages are beginning to pick up and hopefully they make the more prudent decision of financially going forward. If President Trump was here, he would say, good economy, what are you talking about? This is a great economy, you know, that's why I'm moving along. But let me illustrate all these points in a graphical form. So this is a total output or total income generation in America, gross domestic product. And generally upward moving, but every once in a while you encounter a gray shaded area, which is associated with economic recession or job losses, stock market correction. So it's never a smooth upward path, but there are little hiccups along the way. We have not had an economic recession for 10 years. So I get this question a lot. Are we due for one? Because surely if you look at the past, it never lasts forever. There's always disruptions you know, along the process. So for people who are looking for economic recession because it's been long, maybe it's due, I don't know how they get the logic other than that time frame logic. But as an economist, I need to know some triggers that would cause recession. For example, in the 1970s, economic recessions, OPEC oil embargo led to 
in today's dollars, equivalent of you go trying to fill up your uh, gas tank, $3 per gallon, shout out to $30 per gallon in today's dollars. That trigger an economic recession. That will not happen in America today because America has become the largest oil producer in the world. So with the large oil production, one do not anticipate price spikes of that level. Maybe it will rise because of some uh, events, you know, Saudi Arabia or uh, maybe Venezuela blowing up, uh, but it will not be going, prices going up from three to $30. Or in fact, prices may actually begin to decline as more oil supplies comes out of North Dakota, West Texas, uh, but we have to see how it goes. Um, so that is not the, uh, one of the trigger of past recession is not there. What would be the other uh, possible trigger? Well, other trigger is artificially infl inflated consumer spending because people borrow way too much or businesses borrow way too much. They borrow the money, spend way too much, uh, and it was unsustainable. And when the debt came due, they were unable to pay and it led to a crash. Subprime lending example would be perfect example of 10 years ago. We never want to have a repeat of those easy mortgage lending days. Uh, but even in the other period, 1980s and other uh, period, anytime there was an overborrowing, that led to some bad events later. Today, we don't have overborrowing conditions. Yes, auto loans are a little bit higher. Maybe the credit card debt are a little higher. Student debt has actually uh, risen tremendously. But if you look at the total debt for the consumers, uh, it is very manageable compared to the income they are earning. And furthermore, for the regarding mortgage debt, it is not rising at all. Mortgage debt is about the same, moving to essentially flat line. So uh, there is no overhang of debt situation. And companies, you know, their uh, corporate profits are running at record high levels uh, t uh, today. So, um, a possible other trigger would be if the Federal Reserve aggressively raise interest rates. Uh, if they raise interest rates aggressively, yes, it's possible that they did too much and it pulls down the economic recession, but Federal Reserve is very mindful of their power to influence uh, the economy, and they want to raise the interest rate in a very measured, slow pace. I know some of you think that currently it looks like they're a little aggressive, uh, but from Federal Reserve point of view, they consider this a very measured, slow rate of rate increase uh, that's going on. Uh, so overall, I don't see a trigger that would cause an economic recession, even though we have not had one. So for the next couple of years, I feel very comfortable in saying no recession in 2019, no recession in 2020. In 2021, it's a little too farther out, so we have to wait and see as to what would happen. And if you look at other countries like Australia, which had not had a recession for 20 years, uh, in other country of that example, I mean, there are some countries who can just chug along. So there's no reason why, just because of 10 year time frame, uh, there will be a recession over the horizon. Same figure, data, but now in a percentage term. So rather than the actual number of production or income, how is it changing? And the most recently available GDP growth rate was 4.2%. President Trump, or I should say Donald Trump, before becoming the president when he was campaigning, uh, he was saying that if I am the president, I will bring the GDP growth up to 3%. So he has been campaigning on that uh, during the, uh, the uh, uh, a couple of years ago. Second quarter was 4.2%. First quarter was not. First quarter was two and change. Third quarter data is coming out very soon, I believe uh, this week, later this week. Uh, and it will probably show about three and a half. Fourth quarter will be decent at maybe two and a half or even three. So for the year as a whole, 2018, we will get 3% GDP growth easily, maybe 3.3%. So it will be the first time uh, in a long time where we do actually get a GDP growth uh, up past the 3% uh, uh, mark. And I mentioned about the high net worth combination of stock market and the housing, and you can look at this chart. It is not only about recovering, but it is just way past the past prior peak and rising and rising and rising. The only concern on this wealth would be maybe it is concentrated wealth. So there is more inequality in America. 
uh, and uh, certainly technology sector, if you work for Facebook, Google, Apple, uh, you know, you are getting those stock options quickly. And of course, Jeff Bezos, you know, suddenly shot, shot up to the top because of that exposure to the technology uh, sector. Uh, and housing wealth, again, the source of middle class wealth, home values are rising. So if one is a homeowner, they're steadily building up their wealth. Uh, so this is uh, uh, contributing. Uh, unemployment rate, Wichita, uh, US, I don't know which is which, but this is pretty much a very similar, every locality that I go to, to show that, don't think that your economy is fairly immune from the rest of the country. If the American economy, you know, sneezes one way or the other, the rest of the country pretty much follows the, you know, catches the cold and follows the same direction. So however the American economy moves, uh, the at least unemployment rate will move very, very similarly. Uh, and the job situation, uh, this is for the total U.S. After, I think, 8 million job losses, one can see the huge run up in jobs. And this is where I think, you know, just from political angle, I'm an economist, and there are so many factors the economy is uh, at play. I think, you know, from politicians, they want to get too much of the credit. They always, you know, play the political angle. Uh, but one may even, you know, you know uh, uh, debate because I think uh, President Obama is saying, well, it's the momentum factor, and President Trump picked up the momentum, uh, while other people was that President Trump changed the trajectory with the tax cuts and less regulation. Uh, but it's been job growth continuing uh, for the uh, uh, 18 million jobs from that low point. And economists, I think most economists would agree, you know, politicians have some role, but not the major, major role. It's the uh, entrepreneurs uh, and the businesses uh, that are uh, at play. Now, this is a very interesting chart. This is where Wichita diverged from the rest of the country. So there is some fluctuation in terms of total jobs in the region. So there was a job growth uh, before the recession. The Great Recession occurred. You lost all of that job creation then a very slow recovery from that. And what is interesting is total number of jobs today. Yes, it is higher compared to five years ago, and that's why you had that additional home buyers. Uh, but compared to year 2000, it is neutral, no job creation, even though the rest of the country were rising at 13%. Um, so this is uh, one area where one can say that Wichita is diverging from the rest of the country, and it could be that more concentrated manufacturing industry, especially on the uh, aircraft production, uh, which led to uh, this more unique situation. Uh, in other places, like Seattle, you know, they produce aircrafts, but they have so much other industry there that everything is uh, assumed. Uh, the job openings today are record high. I have not walked through the downtowns of Wichita, uh, but uh, in most downtowns in America, uh, there is a sign on the windows to say that help wanted, inquire within. And I'm sure probably in Wichita as well. And you say, well, yeah, there looks like plenty of job openings, but is it only a cashier's position? But if you go to LinkedIn, there are job openings for accountants, computer programmers, uh, if you go to construction site, major job uh, uh, wanted uh, for skilled construction workers, welders, uh, carpentry, wood framers. Cleveland, you think of Cleveland, well, how is it? Or Detroit, and people in Cleveland and Detroit, the managers, business companies would say, we can expand more if they are more qualified workers, better welders, uh, but they just simply cannot find skilled workers. So right now, America is running into uh, this bottleneck of not able to find all the skilled workers. Let me put this job opening, which is sky high, on the next graph. So this blue line will be the blue line on the next chart. So blue is the job opening, while the red is people without a job and searching for job. Very unusual situation in America today where there are more job openings than people who are searching for jobs. Free society, we will not have 0% unemployment, but still you say if there are more job openings than uh, people are searching for jobs, I mean, maybe unemployment rate could go down even more. But it will not, not go down because of a couple of frictions. One is geographic. Coal miner in West Virginia loses a job. There are plenty for jobs in Nashville, but they don't want to make that move because maybe they are uh, tied to the family uh, in West Virginia. So people who are unemployed are unwilling to make the move where there are plenty for uh, jobs. The other reason uh, is the skill set. 
especially like in the construction industry. They are saying, well, we need to hire more construction workers. Uh, yeah, people just don't have the skill set to go into it. Uh, and uh, you know, some people are saying that maybe we need to begin to put more focus on some vocational training. Did you know there is a massive shortage of truck drivers? Do not be surprised if Amazon Prime account, they have to raise the price because delivery costs will be higher as they try to pay more to recruit uh, truck drivers. Uh, so uh, it's a very unique situation where there are more job openings than people who are searching for a job. Companies in the meantime are not firing workers, so these are a number of people who are filing for unemployment checks. They are not, fire, uh, they are not filing for unemployment checks because they are not getting fired. Uh, so another very good sign about the economy. So economy is good, economy is great, but home sales right now are not breaking higher along with the economy. Pending contracts showing stable or neutral trends. We have low inventory, at least that was the case in the spring, summer. Now you are beginning to see a little more inventory, partly due to the seasonal patterns. In autumn, once the school begins, there's more inventory buildup uh, as the buyers sort of taper off. Uh, but other people are saying they are sensing something a little different. Uh, it's not only a seasonal pattern. There's suddenly more inventory showing up uh, right now. But broadly speaking, uh, if you look at historical trend, we are still at a low inventory levels. Uh, weakening affordability, low home ownership rate, low first-time buyer participation, and diminished optimism about home buying. Let me cover all this point again in a graphical form. Pending contracts. Well, pending is not closings, okay, because uh, the, the, uh, the only thing that can happen between pending contracts to closing, uh, as every realtor knows, know, uh, is something bad, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, but pending still uh, is a good indicator about future closings, and right now the pending contracts is showing some downward pattern, which is implying that closing activity could be uh, softer even in the upcoming months. Uh, so the pending is not rising, even though we have good, great economy. And if you look at the regional variation, Midwest holding on, South a little higher, but it is the West region that is taking a big tumble in terms of pending contracts. West region, California, Oregon, Washington, you can even include the mountain states of Utah, Nevada, Arizona, Idaho. Job growth is very solid, yet they cannot buy or pending is coming down because home prices have risen tremendously, something like 60% in the past five years. So even if you have a job, if things are expensive, simply you cannot afford to buy. One extreme example, Silicon Valley. Typical home in Silicon Valley. Believe me, it is smaller size than typical home in Wichita. <laughs> Tip typical home in Silicon Valley, you have to have income of $270,000 to qualify for a mortgage under typical underwriting standards. So you can have a good job in California, but you cannot buy simply because prices have just outrun people's uh, income. And uh, inventory, falling inventory is the reason why prices uh, have been rising. Uh, and price growth is not only in the West region. You go to Dallas, Texas, they will say price growth of 50% in the past five years. Uh, you go to uh, Kansas City, they will say the price growth has been uh, quite solid uh, in the Kansas City. Uh, so it's all across America where prices have risen because of this downward inventory trend. And this is the price index. So the blue is Kansas City metro market. Uh, and the red and the green is two other major cities in Kansas, uh, Wichita and Topeka, uh, showing very similar trend. So one thing about Wichita and Topeka, at least in the price index, is showing that price do not go down in a major way. When the prices go down, yes, there is some little adjustment, but it does not go in a major way. And the price growth does not go grow in a major way either. Kansas City, a little larger metro, uh, one see a little bigger fluctuation. But after that uh, foreclosure crisis that was there a few years ago, look how rapidly it has come back. And also in a long-term time frame, this is a price index showing you know, how we would have changed. In Kansas City, prices would have more than double compared to 20 years ago. So someone who bought a $100,000 home uh, 20 years ago, today they are sitting on $200,000 home. 
uh, locally, uh, it is uh, here almost two times, 1.8 times what it was uh, compared to 1995. So prices are rising partly because of the inventory downward trend that has been occurring year in, year out uh, for the past few years. And only in the recent months, you sense a little change in inventory, but overall the trend has been uh, downward. I think the true test of inventory is spring. When spring arrives, you have to say, is the inventory in, the, in spring 2019 about the same as in 2018, which means still tight condition, or is that measurably higher? So you have to wait and see it in the springtime to see uh, what will happen. Mortgage rate rising, and maybe this is the one trigger as to why the buyers have tapered away uh, from the marketplace. But this is a mortgage rate trend. Blue is mortgage rates. Uh, red line is the 10-year treasury. So if you want to know what's happening to the mortgage rate, just look at the 10-year treasury and just add up a few points and you get the mortgage rates. So those are the trends. And for consumers or some brokers and uh, realtors, they may be asking the question, well, you look at this trend, every time there was a little bit of a spike, you wait a bit, it goes down. So maybe right now the mortgage rate 10-year high 4.9% average. If I wait, maybe it will go back down to 4%. Or maybe it will go down even to the threes. Maybe that's what I should be doing. For some people who are calculating as such, wait and wait and hope for lower rates, forget it. It's not going to happen. Uh, in my projection, we are in a fundamentally different situation. Longer you wait, you may be facing even higher interest rate environment. Why? Several reasons. First, the Federal Reserve is now beginning to raise rates. They will say normalization. Interest rate cannot be zero for a long time. And Federal Reserve controls something called Fed funds rate. They don't control mortgage rate, by the way. Mortgage rate acts on its own. Uh, they control Fed funds rate, where the banks borrow among each other. Uh, and they have been raising these rates, and probably another rate hike in December of this year, after the election, they don't want to do anything before the election, after the election, and probably two or three rates of uh, rounds of rate increase in 2019. So Federal Reserve is clearly raising rates, but again, they are very mindful. They cannot be too aggressive, otherwise they can tip the economy uh, into a recession, and they are aware of that. Uh, so Federal Reserve is raising rates. Uh, which means that maybe the long-term rates, which the Federal Reserve do not directly control, but surely if the short-term rates rise, long-term rates like mortgage rate could be nudged up in some way. Another reason for higher mortgage rate anticipation is this, Federal Reserve balance sheet. And you say, what the heck is that? Well, several years ago, Federal Reserve printed a lot of money. They print a lot of money, and you say, what happened to that cash? Because it did not reach my pocket. <laughs> well, Federal Reserve printed the cash in order to buy mortgage-backed securities and government bonds so that you would have low long-term rates, like mortgage rate hitting 3.5%. So even though directly you do not receive the cash, indirectly consumers benefit when they locked in at those 3.5% mortgage rates. They printed the money, buy these long-term bonds in order to bring the long-term interest rates down. So this is what's inside the Federal Reserve. Now they are saying, well, we have to undo this process. We have to normalize, which means now what they had purchased, they have to sell it into the market. They have to find the buyers of what they had purchased. Where are the buyers of these bonds and mortgage-backed securities? Is it Wall Street companies, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley? Is it German pension funds who are looking for rate of return? Is it the Chinese government? Now with trade war discussion, but well, the Chinese government is willing to step in to buy this. Because if there are no buyers, interest rate will be even higher because Federal Reserve is trying to sell some of this and they're saying, please buy, please buy. If there are no buyers, they was okay, we will offer you a higher interest rate, higher interest rate. So uh, that if there are buyers, then interest rate would not move so fast, but if there are no buyers, they would have to raise interest rate even more to entice uh, buyers. But one thing the Federal Reserve has indicated is that it wants to undo this process in a slow motion. So they printed money in a fast pace, but they will undo this process in a slow motion over a 20-year time span. 
So in a very, very slow rate so that the interest rate are not greatly impacted. Another reason why interest rate would be higher, so people hoping for lower rates, again, forget it. I think those are wrong decision, wrong planning. You should be planning for higher interest rates. Because another factor that will lead to higher interest rate is inflation rate is beginning to pick up. People on Social Security check for several years, zero cost of living adjustment, then zero cost of living adjustment, because government said no inflation, you don't deserve cost of living adjustment. Now, cost of living adjustment, I think last year was one and a half. In 2019, from January, it will be something about 2.8%. So cost of living adjustment on Social Security check is rising because government is now saying inflation is picking up. The red line is the inflation, just overall uh, the inflation. When my parents first purchased their home in the late 1970s, their mortgage rates were 15%. Millennial generations have no idea of 15% mortgage rate. Oh, wow, they think those rates are uh, those offered at a back alley by a mafia. You know, you negotiate that uh, long, short deals going on. But people who have been in the business for a long period would know that was very common back in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And you said, why was the mortgage rate 15% during those times? Well, because every time you go to a grocery store, prices were 10% higher. You go to a grocery store again, and it's 10% higher. So there was a loss in purchasing power. So if you are a lender, you lend the money, and the money that you get back during an inflationary time would have lost value. And the only way to compensate for that is to charge high interest rate to compensate for the high inflation. So if inflation picks up, then mortgage rates will have to rise, independent of the Federal Reserve. It doesn't matter what the Fed does. So automatically, the lenders will say, high inflation, I have to charge a little higher interest rate to be compensated for the loss in purchasing power uh, of the dollar. So as the inflation rate begins to pick up, that's another factor why interest rate will be higher going into 2019. I will say that well, there will be no return to 1970s dollars inflation. Inflation we are talking about is going from zero, to one and a half, to now 2.8%, and maybe 3% at top, and then it will begin to retreat back down. So it is not a major increase in inflation, but directionally a little nudging up. So a little nudging up in interest rate, and therefore my mortgage rate forecast this time next year may be about five and a half. I don't think it will cross 6% line, uh, but something higher than what it is today. Finally, the national debt has risen, risen, risen. Uh, no ending sight, especially with the baby boomers. Every day, every single day, 10,000 baby boomers uh, turns to receive social security check. So there's nothing to suggest national debt will be uh, contained. And this increase uh, has been occurring from the Great Recession up, up and up. Uh, and you can say this is, uh, you know, sins of the parents passing on to the future generation. Or you can say from economic impact, you know, aside from the moral impact of passing that on to our children. Uh, but the economic impact is that, well, doesn't large debt lead to something bad? And you can say, well, Venezuela is blowing up right now. And you can say Greece, who have even larger debt than America, would blow up, yet they're not blowing up thanks to German subsidy. Germans are helping them out. And Germans don't like it. They're helping out indirectly because they're part of the European Union. You know, as being part of the European Union, they're uh, being helped by the Germans. But without Germany, Greece will be uh, blowing up. But also at the same time, Japan has a larger debt than the U.S., relatively speaking, you know, relative to GDP and so forth. But Japan appears to be very stable with very low interest rate environment. So in some cases, large debt, it blows up. In other cases, it doesn't blow up. So, but somehow it just does not feel right that the debt level is uh, rising and rising and rising. Uh, so we don't know what the impact of this is, but if something bad happens, I mean, it's not going to be something good. You know, it will be either no impact or something bad impact. Uh, but this trend uh, certainly is not a comforting uh, trend. So mortgage rate will be rising again, 5.5 percent this time next year. That's my projection. So with the rising rates, what does this mean for home sales? So let's rewind the tapes and look at what happened. 
1984, 1987, and other, other years, when interest rate change, interest rate increase, at a time when there was a good economy, jobs were being created. So these are the times when interest rate increased while jobs were being created. So if you look at the, all the periods, essentially home sales in few months may have declined. But if you look at over a 12 month time frame, longer time frame, home sales essentially remain stable. So rates can be higher, but overall home sales, because of job creation, remain stable. Only time it did not happen was during the subprime lending, and of course those are special cases. You are giving the money to people uh, without any financial cre uh, credentials. Uh, so it blew up, uh, but, uh, but in other times, when there was a strong job creating economy, interest rate increase, home sales stood firm. So maybe this is what we can anticipate going into 2019. Home ownership rate is picking up, but very slowly. So again, good economy, but home ownership rate is not really picking up, and it has important consequence because of this. You look at the wealth distribution in America, I mentioned about some concentrated wealth, but also the middle class wealth. For the middle class, their wealth is more tied to their housing than to the stock market, and you see the substantial difference in net worth between homeowners and renters. Renters, barely visible. And I'm surprised also some statistics that Federal Reserve mentioned, I, you know, I speak with other economists, and something like one third of Americans cannot come up with $400 emergency money, you know, you, uh, something like this. I mean, those are just terrible statistics to think that one third of Americans are in that situation. But homeowners have substantially higher net worth, and I put two periods, blue is year 2000, uh, and the red is year 2016, to show that even through the bubble, crash recovery phase uh, that homeowners have come out on top. Of course, some homeowners who went for closure, they're renting, you know, they, those are uh, traumatic times. But on average, homeowners are doing much, much better uh, than renters. So if, if we have this low home ownership rate, uh, that means that not wider number of Americans are participating in the wealth gains. Uh, and that's why it is critical to assure uh, that we have uh, that there are no artificial barriers to uh, home ownership. Uh, people who contribute to RPAC, that's Realtor Political Action Committee, thank you very much. Uh, it opens up conversation in Washington. Uh, so some uh, elected officials will not agree with any of our position, but at least they're willing to listen, and sometimes they agree with our position. Here's one example. Tax reform. Congress was considering drastically reduce, reducing mortgage interest deduction to up to about half a million dollars. Law passed at 750,000. And also Congress said property tax deduction, no more. In fact, both House of Representatives said no property tax deduction, Senate said no property tax deduction. You remember the US government course, civic course, and you said, well, if House say no, and Senate passes a bill, it goes to a conference, and they try to resolve what is different, not what they agreed on. Something that is agreed on is not even is on the agenda. But during that conference period, where they said no property tax deduction by both House and the Senate, realtors responded with call to action. 300,000 realtors across the country sent a letter to their elected official to say property tax deduction is very important. So I have never actually remember another incident where both House and Senate agreed on something, but they changed at the conference, and after the conference they passed, to say that uh, people will be permitted up to $10,000 in property tax deduction. What does that mean for Can uh, people in Kansas? 98% of Kansas residents will be fully able to deduct property tax if they needed to. About 98% of Kansas homeowners will be fully able to deduct mortgage interest if they wanted to uh, at the 750,000 level. So that's the power of our pack in my view. So thank you very much uh, for people uh, who contribute. But the other area that we are working on in the RPAC is uh, about the credit access. Uh, one, you know, we try to support uh, realtor-friendly candidates. We don't care about the political party. If they are friendly to real estate, uh, we think real estate as the real, you know, health of the real estate is very good for the U.S. society. Uh, so independent of the political party, anyone who is supporting real estate policies, we're very friendly. And one person that we give a lot of money uh, at the RPAC uh, 
uh, is Senator Tim Scott, an African-American senator uh, from uh, South Carolina who happens to be Republican. Because he's, uh, Tim, Senator Tim Scott has expressed, he is very concerned about a low home ownership rate among African-Americans. Is there something artificial barrier that is placed on African-Americans, uh, whether it's institutionalized or unintentionally? So he wants to look into this. Uh, so, so we are working with some think tanks in Washington to look at uh, some uh, what could be the cause? But it's not only African Americans. Asian Americans have much lower home ownership rate. Many Asian Americans are small business owners. Small business owners have fluctuating income, and if you have fluctuating income, forget about getting a credit, uh, mortgage access. So uh, maybe we can enhance FICO score methodology to say that why don't we give positive points, especially in today's big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all this computer. Remember, when you shop at Amazon online, they know what you should buy next, you know, through all this programming. So uh, why don't we have some kind of credit score methodology to say if you pay your rent on time, maybe some positive point shows up. You pay your utility uh, payments on time, some positive point showed up. If you are financially responsible, yes, let's show some positive points rather than only negative points for missing a rental payment, landlord cost, the credit office, you know, being negative, let's give positive points for people who are showing financial responsibility. Asian American business owners, fluctuating income, but they're always paying their debt on time, why don't we give positive points for that? So uh, looking into that type of thing, so you know, Senator Tim Scott will be working, you know, trying to find his Democratic uh, senators on the other side trying to get a bipartisan bill passed and maybe this will be something that can happen in 2019 uh, because this low home ownership rate again uh, means that America's access to this income through home ownership uh, we are not widening that access. No return of subprime, we don't want that, but people who are showing financial responsibility along with willingness to stay well within their budget, not overstretching their budget, maybe uh, you know, there's an opportunity. Diminish optimism about home buying. We take a very simple survey asking consumers, is it a good time to buy a home? And the figure was something like 45% before turning lower to under 40% in 2018. So there is a diminished optimism. Um, and this is in contradiction to this. This chart shows, do you think prices will be higher next year or next two years? Gallup survey, Fannie Mae survey, NAR consumer survey, and we also ask realtors, based on what you are seeing in your neighborhood, do you think the prices will be higher one year from now? So overwhelmingly, Americans believe prices will be higher one year from now. Then why the diminish optimism? If you believe the price of Bitcoin would be higher, would you purchase today? Now, I don't think Bitcoin would be higher, but, but if you firmly <laughs> believe that it was higher, what about Amazon stock price? If you firmly believe that it was higher one year from now, would you buy Amazon stocks? If you firmly believe uh, real estate prices would be higher, you should have greater optimism about buying, yet they're expressing diminished optimism. And when we look into the data, it's really related to inventory shortage. They are tired of multiple bid process, especially on the moderately priced homes. And, and it's more prevalent in the Kansas City metro area, you know, the job growth is much stronger uh, a part. Uh, and people are saying, look, uh, I don't want to participate in this hurried decision with other buyers. Uh, I want to see 10 homes. Even on television shows, house hunting, they get to see at least three homes before deciding. <laughs> and now the realtors are saying, here's one home, make a bid, otherwise it's going to be gone. And the buyers are very unhappy about that process. So I think the optimism about home buying would increase if we had more inventory selection. Right now, you are sensing more inventory. Maybe this is just an adjustment period, but after a few months, consumers say, look, I tried in the spring, it didn't work, but maybe I'm gonna try again, maybe in the, in the winter months uh, where there's less heated competition. So maybe that's a possible, we are in a good uh, economy. Uh, people indicating is it a good time to sell are still beginning to rise, and I don't foresee this as somehow uh, that there will be an oversupply condition in the marketplace, but it's more of the case where people who experience easy price gains said, well, let me wait another year, give me additional price gains. Um, but uh, now the days of easy price gains are over. 
and homeowners have been staying in their home for much longer than average. Typically, they stay in their home for about eight years because now they have new jobs. They need to be a little different location, less commute time, or they have additional child. They don't have their bedroom. Or elementary school was good, but middle school, no, they need to change school district. So there's always a reason why people move, but people have not been moving. And today, average is like 10, 11 years staying in their home rather than eight historically. So I think um, they've made more people uh, recognize days of easy price gains are over, and now they're going back to the normal process of whether they need to uh, buy a new home. Why is inventory short? Because builders have not been building. Um, so this is the single family housing starts. If you're land developers, uh, there would be demand for uh, home building activity. I mean, the home builders are saying they're, they're growing this year. Even though home sales are not, new home sales are actually higher this year compared to before. So there is a demand for land lot developments uh, and land purchases uh, going on. And this is the Wichita market, again, following the national trend and not really having picked up, uh, especially on the moderately priced homes. So how to boost home construction, provide some regulatory relief to community banks, because right now the builders who are building are principally the national builders or regional builders who can get Wall Street money. Typically, it is local mom and pop builders who build, who build 10 or 12 homes a year, but they need loans from the community banks. But they were unable to do because of the excessive financial regulation or Dodd-Frank, uh, that was our call. Uh, so relaxing some of that could provide some uh, more lending uh, to the cons homes, mom and pop home builders. Others, tariffs. Anything that boosts the cost of construction is adding on the cost. So the builders would say, look, everything is more expensive. Now I can only build expensive homes. I cannot build moderately priced homes. There are no margins. But in order to build homes where there's the strongest demand, the moderately priced home, we need to remove any artificial cost uh, that is related to construction. Uh, don't be too stringent on zoning, landing, uh, zoning land use uh, rules. Uh, and some of the empty shopping malls, maybe they can convert that into condominiums and also critical vocational training uh, for the construction industry. Uh, maybe we have been s saying to high school students, you have to go to college or otherwise you will get, you will be branded as a, being a loser in life. And maybe this is a wrong way to view it because student debt levels are rising. At the same time, we are short on vocational uh, training. I remember my high school days and you can remember your high school days. There's somebody who are clearly academically talented that should go to college. Then there are people who are trying. Maybe they should get a shot. And then you have about one third of the high school students you say, surely they don't even open up a textbook. Now why should they go to college? Because if they go uh, into a vocational training, they can earn good middle income salaries. And you can even say that you know, your grandparents, you're looking at the history of America, all our grandparents work in uh, their difficult jobs, farming, uh, you know, laboring, carpentry. And at the end of the day, our grandparents said, you know, I enjoy my work. And when they say they enjoy their work, they were not referring to doing things but they were enjoying their work that they were breadwinner and they could supply the family. So I think we need to bring that back to somehow that uh, more people getting some vocational training uh, may be needed because that's a major uh, worker labor shortage uh, at the moment. Commercial real estate, let me briefly touch upon this and go into the outlook, my time is coming up. Uh, so commercial real estate prices have risen much, much faster than residential prices. Residential prices, no bubble. But there could be a slight bubble in commercial real estate. Prices have run up so much. Industry jargon, cap rates have pounded downward. 5.1% cap rates across all commercial properties. That's the rate of return. Now you are facing a rising interest rate environment, which means surely higher cap rates. And this is what we are noticing about commercial real estate transactions. Fewer transactions in 2017, fewer anticipated once the numbers are in in 2018. So commercial transactions are falling in a good economy. And you say, why? Buyers and sellers disagree on the price. So you have a office building owner, for whatever reason, he wants to cash out. So he remembered what the price was last year, and he said, well, this will be the price this year. Good economy, I'm not reducing the price. 
high occupancy, rents are coming in, I am not going to reduce price. While the investors who want to buy that property is looking at rising interest rates, the borrowing costs and further rising interest rate, and they are saying, I cannot pay that price in a rising interest rate environment. Buyers and sellers disagree on the price, no transaction gets done. So if you happen to represent commercial property owners, you may want to consider convincing them to reduce some prices at some level in order to attract buyers. Otherwise, transaction will not get done. If you are in property management, don't worry. There's high occupancy, rents are coming in, everything is fine uh, in the property management. It's only when they want to sell the property where there will be disagreement in prices between the buyer and the sellers. Good economy, sellers do not want to reduce the price, while the buyers, rising interest rate, they cannot pay that price. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, if you want to get the transaction deal done. As for the land, uh, with the agricultural prices coming down, uh, partly due to the tariff situation, uh, you know, that could uh, leading to lower yield uh, part. And also the second quarter GDP growth, strong GDP growth that I mentioned, that was partly due to Chinese massively purchasing U.S. soybeans before the tariff went to effect. Now the tariff is in place, there's a lesser demand uh, going forward uh, related to the soybean uh, purchase. So forecast is the following. Home sales would be fairly neutral. Higher rates are not a good news, but the good economy is a good news, cancels each other out, and no meaningful change. Just like in past experiences of a higher interest rate in a good economy, no meaningful change in home sales. So to the degree that you said last year was good year, this year is matching that, well, 2019 will be similar. So very, very similar uh, conditions. Home prices not falling, but the days of easy price gain, especially in the Kansas City area, uh, those days are over. So rather than 8% price gain in a single year, it'll be 8% price gain stretched out over two years, meaning it could be four and four or five and three, uh, but not that easy price gains uh, that one have experienced. And on the commercial real estate, uh, I'm afraid there will be a lot of stubbornness among the owners that don't wanna reduce prices, so there will be fewer transactions and only after they realize there are really truly no buyers, they have to reduce price, but they're just delaying that situation by six months. I mean, they could have done it uh, right at the beginning, uh, but, uh, but uh, it will be mostly, uh, I think, prices in the mid-tier markets, Class B building may hold on because cap rates are still, there's a still uh, uh, a juicy level uh, at that level. Uh, but I think on the trophy properties where cap rates are very, very low, that's where you may see 3 to 7% uh, price adjustment on the commercial real estate. Uh, I have spoken uh, for a long period. Uh, thank you uh, for your patience. And I think overall, uh, you are in a decent shape going into 2019. Thank you very much.